Good afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Alicia Bank, HR Specialist for the Division of Pay and Benefits. On behalf of our Division Director, Tasha Brown, I welcome all of you to our educational seminars. I would also like to extend a warm welcome to those of you that are live streaming on the CMS YouTube, as well as those who are viewing via VTC audio conferencing on our regional offices and the outlying offices in the field. What will you learn today? The first presentation is on estate planning, wills, and trust, in which you will learn the keys to effective estate planning and the importance of having a will trust. The time for this will be from 12 noon to 1.30. The second presentation is on financial planning basics, in which you will gain helpful insight on budgeting, investing, insurance, tax planning, use of credit, and much more. That goes from 2 p.m. to 3.30. Before we get started, I have a few administrative notes to share with you. Please mute your phones to assist with the noise and distractions. Hold all questions until after the presentation or as directed by the presenter. For those in the audience, please use the microphone to ask questions so that everyone gets a chance to benefit from your answers. Be sure that you sign in and complete the survey questionnaire. Before you leave, please drop off the completed survey to the benefit specialist monitoring the tables right outside. For those who are not in person, you may email your survey to the HR Center Help Desk at hrcenterhelpdesk at cms.hhs.gov. If at any time you have problems with the phones, please call the WebEx for assistance. And now, our guest speaker, Mr. David Walter. Can you hear me okay? All right. Your mind for the first little bit. I'm going to talk about investing a little bit first, and then we'll segue into the estate part. I'm going to talk about the accumulation phase of our lives. There are generally three phases to our lives. Accumulation phase, where we're trying to accumulate as much money as possible. There is the distribution phase of our life, where at some point, hopefully, we'll retire and then seek income. And the last phase of our life is the transfer phase, where we want to make sure that whatever money we've accumulated, we want to leave to the people we love, not the people we dislike. Let me give you background on me so you know. I'm Dave Walter. I grew up in Burtonsville. Do you all know where Burtonsville is? Down Route 29. If I would bought real estate back when mom and dad moved there since 61, I probably wouldn't be standing in front of you today. Okay, hindsight is always 2020. I'm married. I have three boys, David is 36, Brian is 33, and Michael is 31. I have four grandchildren and one more on the way, so I'm a little older than some of you would guess. Patty, my wife, is a cancer nurse, so Patty brings a very interesting perspective home to the kitchen table. I am now in my 40th year working for RBC, so I'm old school, old vet, I'm not a newbie. And so I bring a different argument home to the kitchen table about pay yourself first. So you all know where I work, we have absolutely no pension plan, nor did Patty have one at Howard County General Hospital. She's now retired. She had a 403B, which is akin to your TSP. I have a 401K, which is akin to your TSP. And I have no match, nor did Patty. So I'm a tremendous SOB sorry about paying us first because the American Indians discovered that the best helping hand they got was at the end of their own arm. So I'm going to warn you, when we have left this place for the last day, make sure you have your financial ducks in a row. The more money walking in the door the day we all retire, the better. The bigger the checks, the better. I've never had anybody in 40 years come in my office and say, damn you, Dave, I have too much money. I've never had that complaint in my office. By the way, you need to know my philosophy. Keep it simple, sweetheart. Use common sense. Pay yourself first and be debt-free. Did you all hear what I said about debt? Get out of debt. 
I had a 67-year-old gentleman experiences the best teacher yesterday refinancing a home equity loan, which for the most part, deductibility is gone in 18 unless you use it to improve the value of the home, who was quickly refinancing and putting it in addition to his first into one new loan. He's 67 years of age. He plans to take out a 15-year mortgage. I don't know about you all sitting here today. That's not my idea of a financial plan for retirement. By the way, he and his wife are both retired and he's going to have a mortgage payment from now until he's 82. Is that your idea of a financial plan, yes or no? By the way, the Employee Benefits Research Institute every year does a survey. Latest survey said 34% of the respondents mentioned that their game plan for retirement would be they're going to work until they're 80. Now, my wife's in the business. There's only one fly in that ointment, and you all know what it is, is gosh help us if what comes up? Some sort of what? Health issue. Now, along the lines of debt-free, I think, and you can argue with me, I'll take all arguments, I think the day you retire you should be debt-free if you're going to stay in the house you're in now and you know it forever, they're going to carry you out in the box like me, I think you should have the mortgage paid off. I have folks who want to argue with me all the time that a mortgage is a write-off. It is not a write-off. I beg to differ with you. My house has been paid off since 1999. You can't put a dollar amount on the emotional freedom it gives me up here to have absolutely no mortgage. It's wonderful. I don't have a car payment. I have absolutely no debt. It is the most wonderful feeling in the world. Do I like paying taxes? No, not necessarily, nor do any of you, but it's a given. This is a pretty gosh darn nice place to live. I can go to one of seven states and control state and local taxes, Florida being one of the most popularly mentioned, as you all know. But I'm going to beg you on my knees today, get out of debt. You cannot get ahead. And I never get asked in my office in 40 years, haven't been, how much of a mortgage can I carry into retirement and how much credit card debt can I carry into retirement? We never get asked those questions. And I've never had anybody cuss me for saying, as I said earlier, dag nabbit, Dave, I have too much money. That's never mentioned in my office. So I'm going to urge you to pay yourselves first. Yes, sir. Yes. All right, your name is? Sorry. Your name? Marianne. Marianne's question was, Dave, if I have a very low interest rate on my mortgage, say it's 2.5%, wouldn't it be more beneficial to be investing, say, in the market? In 2008, 2009, as you know, when the C fund dropped 38%, the I fund was down 43%, the best investment that year would have been to do what? Pay additional principal towards my what? Mortgage. So I'm a big believer in having a foot in both camps. If you said to me, Dave, I'm going to stay in my house forever, and I know it, I would urge you to send some money towards paying the mortgage faster and some money hopefully maxing what? During the accumulation phase that I want to talk about today, and you're getting a smattering of what I normally cover. I can go two hours. I lecture at National Security Agency. I go six hours. CIA, I'm four hours. I was just at NGA, I'm four hours. You're getting just a smattering today. So if you like this, you have to tell this gentleman up here, we want more, okay? Won't happen unless you give that feedback. But in answer to your question, during the accumulation phase, because what I want you to be prepared for is retirement. My contention is we all come to work because we want to retire someday. That's the brass ring we're all trying to attain someday. So, how do I get there? The best way, bar none, is this guy right here, the TSP. You can't beat it with a 10-foot pole. I continually run into folks, whether SIRs or FERS, who are not participating to the fullest extent. Now, some of you have heard me before. For those of you who have not, 
I'm going to ask for forgiveness now. I need you to promise me that you will forgive me because I'm going to make a statement that is a little knifing. It may make you a little bit black and blue. It may touch some nerves, but I'm going to make it anyway. But I need to know you'll forgive me. Does everybody forgive me? I need a nodding of heads. Okay, everybody ready? If you are not maximizing the TSP to the greatest extent that you can afford to do so. Did everybody hear what I said? If you are not maximizing the TSP to the greatest extent that you can afford to do so, you are dead from the neck up. Did you all hear what I said? Because I already told you the day all of us in this room, the one with the most money wins. And I got that from the bumper sticker on the back of a car that says the one with the most toys wins. I said to my wife, it's dead wrong. Should say the one with the most money wins. Patty, if you ever run into her, you can tell her I explained it, said that's crass and materialistic. It's not meant to be crass or materialistic, honey. It means if I want to be a greeter at Walmart, it's because I what? I want to be. Okay? If I want to work at McDonald's or Burger King in retirement, it's because I what? I want to. It's not going to be a what? Have to. My contention is many of those individuals are there because they what? Have to be. We don't want to be in those set of circumstances. Okay, so it's all about putting away as much as you can. So you can't beat the TSP with a 10-foot pole. How much can I put in if I'm under age 50? Let's see how good you are. How much can I put in? 18,500. 18, Thank you, Marianne. All right, now, I turn 50 this October. How much can I put in? Do I have to wait till October, yes or no? No. You can't believe how often in my office I've heard that one. I don't turn 50, Dave, until October of 18, so I can't do the ketchup. By the way, it's not Heinz ketchup. It's regular ketchup, which is an additional how much? $6,000. Now, in my office, I get asked all the time, so I'm going to be Dave Walter off the record. Should I do the Roth TSP or should I do the traditional TSP? Okay, we're already moving beyond max it. You will never cuss me for how much money that TSP is worth down the road. However, two words are echoed in my office constantly, and the two words are, I wish. And it comes in two forms. I wish I'd started what? Earlier. Or I wish I'd saved more. All the time. Can't go back. 2020's hindsight. Okay, so... 18, 5, and 6. Now, Dave, should I do the traditional or should I make it the Roth? Whatever floats your boat, I'm Dave Walter off the record now, I do the traditional. 100%, 24-5, pre-tax. Why? I don't want to pay taxes today. There have been, since 1913, 36 changes in tax brackets. Mr. Trump just enacted the last one. So you can't argue with me from the back of the room that taxes are going up, which is the argument I always hear in my office. They change all the time, 36 times since 1913. So can they go down? Yes. So my emphasis as an investor for me and Patty is, how can I pay the least amount of taxes today? And the voice in the back of the room says, but what will taxes be when you retire? I don't know. I don't care. I care about what? How can I control them today? So if Patty can put 24.5 in her 403B and I can do 24.5 in my 401K, which is 49 grand off our W-2, should we do it? Yes or no? Yes. Especially since Mr. Trump passed the new tax bill. That return next year is going to be very, very simple for the majority of us in this room. You're either going to claim a standard deduction of 24,000 if you're married, 12 if you're single, 18 if you're head of household. If you have itemized deductions that total more than those numbers, congratulations, you can file your itemized. But you're in for a Gomer Pyle surprise. Why? Because health care is limited to 7.5% of your adjusted growth income. Any deductions there? By the way, if you put a number on that line, you don't care about taxes, your health is probably not that good if you put a number on that line. Next is your real estate taxes and state and local taxes, now capped at 10 grand. So if you said, Dave, the state and local taxes taken out of my paycheck are 12 and my property taxes are three, that's 15. Congratulations, it's capped at 10 whether you file standard or you file itemized. New cap, 10K. 
Okay, what's after that? Mortgage interest. What'd they do with mortgage interest? For the millennials who are gonna go out and buy a house for a million bucks, if they finance anything after December 17th or whatever the date was, if they finance anything over 750, not deductible. It was a million prior to the change in the law. So what's Uncle Sam telling us? Get out of debt. If you want to be in debt, I will no longer be your what? I'm not going to be your partner and let you take it off at my expense. You want to incur the debt? Have at it. But if you read between the lines, it's get out of debt. Okay? After mortgage interest, what is there? Charity? After that, it was miscellaneous where you put the tax return, prep fee, safe deposit box, any publications or uniforms or whatever that you had to buy subject to 2% of your adjusted gross income. You know what that? That's gone. So the tax returns almost tell us how much you make, pay this rate and mail in your check. Now it's not quite that simple as I've alluded to, but it's getting pretty gosh darn simple. So the biggest impact we can make tax wise, and I'm getting questions now in the office, Dave, what do I do about 18? You're maximizing your plan at work, TSP, 401k, 403b, 457? No, I'm not. Why not? It's a line seven reduction on the tax return. First line on your tax return. You can bring your income down. In my example of me and Patty, how much? $49,000 since I'm over age 50. Does that help a lot at the table? Yes or no? Some of you may be married to spouses like mine. We're Howard County General Hospital to offer it. Patty could have done the 403B and a 457 like my sister Tammy at Hopkins, who can do both. So you may have a spouse who's eligible to do a 403B and a 457 in the first year to the tune of 24.5 each of those. So Tammy, my sister, can do 49. Her husband, Alan, can do another 24.5. Does 73.5 lowering their W-2 work at tax time? Yes or no? Oh my golly day, yes. So you may want to jot that down if you have a spouse who's eligible for the 403B or 457. Now, traditional versus Roth. The Roth is after tax, and I'm going to make a comment now. That Roth is supposed to be tax-free when we go to take the money out. That is a promise from Congress, in my opinion. And I don't know about you all, they're not very reliable as to promises. Why? In 2012, when they had trouble with the budget, in 2012, at the end of the year, they fired the first salvo over the bow of the boat and said, we're going to make all Roth income, as it comes out, subject to alternative minimum tax, should that apply to your individual circumstances. You know what that would have done? It would have made it what? Taxable for some people who made money enough to qualify to pay what? Alternative minimum tax. Now, you know what? It got nowhere, so don't panic. It didn't get anywhere. But they fired the first salvo over the bow of the boat. And if you tell me that's double taxation, if you so much as say to me, Dave, that's double taxation, I'm going to tell you that they've been doing it since 1987. What do you mean Uncle Sam's been doing it since 87? Any of you in here know anybody who earns Social Security income and is receiving it? Yes or no? Your parents, right? Do you know for married, those of us married, all sources of income when we retire, if our income exceeds 44000 whatever Social Security check we get, 85% of that number is subject to tax again. If you make between thirty-two and 44000 as a retiree, 50% of your Social Security check is subject to tax again. If you're under 32000 you're not worried about taxes. You're wondering how you're going to survive because, gosh, help us if the car in the driveway dies or I still have a mortgage or I've got credit card debt. Okay, single filers, the numbers are 25 and 32. You're below 25, you don't have to pay taxes. 25 to 32, 50% of your Social Security benefits taxed. You're over 32 grand, 85%. What's that called? What are they doing? They're double taxing it. So if you tell me, Dave, that's a break in a promise that Congress made to us, I'm gonna tell you they've already done it. The Grey Panthers back in 87 screamed bloody murder and got nowhere. It went through. So we're paying double taxes on Social Security. So guess what? Can they change the rules on the Roth? 
And then I ran the numbers for David when he was 30, my oldest, now 36. I ran the numbers when David was 30 and I said, Dave, if you put money in the Roth TSP and a Roth IRA to boot, you and Shannon, maximizing each of those accounts I've mentioned, will have $2,580,000 tax-free when you hit 60. Not 65, 60, and by the way, I used a rate of return of 6%, which is Warren Buffett's number. Warren Buffett has told us we all should earn at least 6% on our investment money. If you're not earning 6, you're falling short. Why? Inflation's averaged 3. So I'm going to warn all of you who might be sitting in the G fund today at a whopping 2% average rate of return. You're not even close to inflation. Inflation's averaging 3. Wait till you pay taxes when the money comes out. You're falling way short. You're eroding your purchasing power. So guess what? They can change the rules in the Roth. I said, Dave, I'm not sure that IRS or Congress is going to let you walk around when we have these two programs, one of them being here, is it not? Medicare? Yes or no? Don't we have two programs, Medicare and Social Security, that might be running a little short of money? Yes or no? What is Congress doing? Kicking the what? Kicking the can down the road. Why? It's a very hot political issue. So I'm not banking on the Roth, and I told you this is Dave Walter off the record. It's not RBC, it's me. I'm betting that they're going to go after that Roth money. Because then you can take David and Shannon, Christine and Brian, Michael and Kim, just my, kit, my crew, and start doing the math. If everybody's walking around with $2,580,000 tax-free, isn't that going to become attractive, yes or no? Okay. So you decide, I don't live at your house. Now, I'm going to tell you something if you haven't read the particulars. When you go to retire, at some point you're going to hit this age, hopefully, 70 and a half. You're going to have to take a required minimum distribution. Some of you call it MRD, minimum required distribution. It's really RMD, doesn't matter, MRD or RMD. At age 70 and a half, you have to take money out. By the way, if you're in the Roth TSP, you have to take money out. If the money were instead in a Roth IRA because you rolled it over to a Roth IRA, you can die with it and never have to take a distribution. Did you all hear what I said, yes or no? In a Roth IRA, I have no RMD. Don't ask me why the TSP has this. I don't know. I'm just the messenger. I want you to be aware of it. You should know about your options at work here. Okay, questions so far. I'm, I got a motor. Am I doing okay so far? Yes or no? Still speaking English? Okay. So you have traditional versus Roth. Pre-tax, post-tax. Now I get asked, so you all know from millennials, what do you think, Mr. Dave? Should I do, how, what should I do? So sometimes I'll tell the millennials, 18.5, you can do 92.50 Roth. You can do 92.50 traditional down the road when you go to retire, you'll go, oh, should have put it all here. Oh, should have put it all there. So sometimes the millennials want a foot in each camp. It's okay. I already told you my camp, I'm in the what? Traditional, I don't want to pay taxes today. And I'm not concerned with paying taxes down the road. It's a given. I have to pay them. Okay? So you can't beat the TSP. Everybody with me? Yes or no? Now, you want to know where to put it? Yes or no? You want to know where to invest it? Okay. You basically have CSI, F and G, so we'll take the TV show. It's easier that way to mem remember. C fund is S&P 500, in case you don't know. S fund is small cap. I is international, meaning overseas. F is bonds. G is guaranteed interest. Do me a favor. You should not be sitting in the F fund now. Not a penny now. Why? The Federal Reserve is doing what with interest rates? They're raising them. You're taking a hit in your F fund every time interest rates go up. If you don't believe me, go to the website. Through April, you're minus two and change in the F fund. You don't want to sit there. If you want to be in something safe, go to the G. As interest rates go up, your G fund rate will increase. When you hear the Federal Reserve, Mr. Powell, the new chairman, say, I'm done raising interest rates, then you can go back to the F fund. For the time being, get out. 
But Dave, I'm in that L30 or L40 or L50. You've got money in the F fund. Understand where your money is. If you can sleep at night with that risk, it's your money, it's not mine. I wouldn't be in F fund now. Okay? Now, I'm more oriented towards growth. So I'm going C, S, and I. Anybody who came to see me the last two years, I said I want 40 I, 30 S, and 30% C. And I've had people say in my office, you're telling me to get out of the C fund? It's been doing very, very well. Yeah, seven out of the last 10 years, the C fund's won. You all know what won last year, don't you? The I fund. Every dog has its day. But you know what we are as investors? We chase results. The iFund has been on sale for a long time now. You should have been buying the iFund. My industry is the only industry where when we have a sale, nobody shows up. And you know, so far this year, we've had a 10% off sale. And I know you all get the coal circular to your house. And it says, come in, you know, for mom's day or dad's day, and you're going to get 10, 20, or 30% off. We'll peel the sticker. Everybody know what I'm talking about? And at the cash register, oh, I either get 10, 20, or 30% off. We had a 10% off sticker sale. You know what? Nobody shows up. You know when my phone rings off the hook? I'll come get your question. You know when we get the phone ringing off the hook? When the market's at a new high. Do you know earlier, 2000, about 2 to 2007, the iFund went every year in a row, and I couldn't beg you on my knees enough to put money in the C fund. Why? Because the iFund was kicking. So you know what we do? We chase results. You need to stop and think for a minute. I want to buy what's on sale. And as a matter of fact, there isn't one of us in this room, myself included, who goes anywhere unless they're having a what? We're not buying unless there's a sale. So if you have that mentality with everything you do in terms of goods and services, will you do me a favor? Employ it on your plan here at work. And I'm going to give you the best sale buyer in the world, Warren Buffett. You ever heard of him? Yes or no? Second richest person in this country. Let me tell you what he did. August 2015. Said, I'm going to buy Philip 66. Anybody heard of Philip 66? He started buying it at $71 a share. Where was oil? $30 a barrel. Anybody know where oil is today a barrel, cost-wise? $72 a barrel. Anyone want to guess where Philip 66 is? $118 a share. Warren's average cost, 71 and change. Has he made a little money, yes or no? Yes, especially since he bought 77 million shares. Now you can tell me, which I hear in my office all the time, he has lots of money. You know how he started? Buying what nobody else wants. So when we have a sale, can you do me a favor? Show up. In your TSP, buy the one that's on sale. I didn't say move your current balance. I said take new dollars. And if you're oriented towards growth, do me a favor, allocate it accordingly. And then don't do this, the biggest mistake in my office. Dave, I'm 55, I'm 60, I'm 62, I'm 65, I'm retiring. Everything has to now be safe. What are you kidding me? My dad died November 16 at 91. Can you imagine if I had dad's money in the G fund after he retired? 20 plus years of retirement earning 1 to 2%, yes or no? Would my parents have been able to survive, yes or no? Absolutely not. So quit investing to your date of retirement. Invest to your date of life expectancy. I know you don't know what it is because we run financial projections every day in our office constantly. All I need when you come in that'll help me run your plan to a T, I need your date of death when you come in to see me. If you know your date of death, I can plan extremely well but we're living longer. You all know that. We're living longer than ever before. So you, the two biggest concerns are now, especially after 08, 09's debacle, when the market dropped like a rock and we all thought the world was coming to an end, the two biggest questions we should be asking ourselves is, where's my money now? Where should it be? That's what we need to be asking ourselves. And the other question is, will my money last me for the rest of my what? Life. The last thing you want is a phone call 
where you're a little short and you need to go get a job at 78 years of age. Who wants that phone call? Anybody? None of us. So as I said to you earlier, more checks walking in the door when you retire, the bigger the checks, the better. That's the name of the game. So how many checks can I get walking in the door, Dave? You ready? All of you in this room, sources of income at retirement. Sources of income. Number one is pension. Congratulations, all of you in this room have a pension. Anybody SIRS, yes or no? Any show of hands SIRS, congratulations. You have the second best pension plan in the world. 80 plus percent, potentially of your high three. Hot diggity dog. Why? Because we tell you from my side of the desk, you'll need anywhere from 65 to 80 percent the day you walk out. If you stop and think about it, other than that, you're asking for a pay cut. Hey, Dave, can you run my retirement projection? Because I want to know how much of a pay cut I can live with when I retire. Really? You're interested in a pay cut? Yeah, isn't that what everybody talks about? Being in a lower tax bracket the day they retire? Really? You want to be in the highest tax bracket. With Mr. Trump now, for married, I'm going to pick on me, zero to 19,000 and 50 bucks is the lowest tax bracket, 10%. So I moved to Florida, why? Mama didn't raise me to be dumb, I'm not going to pay state and local. Let's pretend I'm in Florida. Patty and I have 19,050 walking in the door. We pay $1,905 in taxes. We net about 17,1. Everybody with me? Conversely, if I told you Patty and I retired, we've attained the status of the highest tax bracket. Our income is over $600,000. You know what my federal taxes are? 161,000. Can I ask you all a question? Does 439,000 go further than 17,1? Yes or no? So can you do me a favor? Stop listening to people at picnics and parties who tell you you want to aspire to be in the lowest tax bracket the day you retire. Dead wrong. You want to be in the highest tax bracket achievable. The higher, the better. You know why? Because those of us who have more money coming in are invariably going to do what? Bitch, whine, moan, rant, rave, yell, cuss, and scream about what? Taxes. So what? At least we're in a position to do what? Pay them. Holy mackerel, if Patty and I are down in Florida at 17-1, you think we're coming back up here to see the grandkids? Yes or no? no? Not a whole lot. Gosh, help us if what dies in the driveway? The car. It's not going to happen. So do me a favor. FERS, you all should know your formula. Let me give you the formula since the bulk of you are FERS. If you retire before 62, you need to know your number, 0.01 times your high three times your years of service. Everybody hear what I said? Basically, 1% of your high three times your what? Years of service. On average, it's 40%. How's that compared to the SERS folks sitting here? It's half. Holy mackerel. But Dave, I got this big TSP in a 5% match. And I think some of you may know in here, back in the days when they introduced the FERS program and tried to get us to switch, there were desktop calculators. I had people such as yourselves calling me and going, Dave, I'm switching from SERS to FERS because I'm going to have so much money in the TSP. Those were the days when the market was doing 18% per year. Did you really think it was going to last? That's like real estate. I've been here 40 years. Do you know how many people come in my office and used to tell me real estate was the only thing to invest in because it never went down? Boy, did we discover that that changed, yes or no? Has that changed? So guess what? Get your ducks in a row. You got a pension. If I'm over 62, 1.1% of your high three. It's a smidge better. Now, you need to know this. What's been proposed by one administration after another after another at the behest of the federal employees. I don't get it, but they want to go to high five. So get your ducks in a row. I was at NGA on Tuesday. They said, what do we do? I said, put away as much money as you can in the what first. What did we just talk about? TSP. That's getting your ducks in a row. Next best is an IRA. And I get this all the time in my office. I don't know if I qualify for an IRA. Why? Well, because I, you know, I fund that TSP account. All of you in this room, if you had, get a W-2 or a 1099, you're eligible to fund an IRA account. Did you all hear what I said? You can fund an IRA. Your income is going to determine whether it's a Roth or a traditional. For those of you who can't do the Roth, like me and Patty, I know your heart bleeds for me. It means we make too much. 
I do the traditional and I've never stopped. I have 925,000 in traditional IRAs. Anybody want that statement at your house? Yes or no? But I know you're going to yell at me and say, but what are taxes going to be, Dave, when you retire? I don't know and I don't care. Why? I'm trying to get as many what walking in the door? Dollars. So you all have pensions. Dave, I'm either SIRS or FERS. Congratulations, you have a leg up on me and Patty. Your next source is Social Security. You're either entitled to it as a FERS, you're entitled to it. Then I get asked this in my office. When should I take it? Mr. Obama changed the rules. He's made it basically very simple for all intents and purposes. It now boils down to if you need it, you take it. Everybody hear what I said? If you need it, you take it. So you can stop going to all those plate licking dinners. You don't need to go to them anymore on strategies as to when to take your Social Security. I'm going to make it very easy. You're either entitled to it at 62, discounted permanently. You can take it at 65, depending upon your year of birth. 66, 67 cutoff is 1960 or later. For every year you wait, you're earning 8%. So I get asked in my office, Dave, should I wait? I can't find any investment in my office paying 8% guaranteed. Did you all hear what I said? I have nothing to offer you paying 8% guaranteed. So if you don't need your Social Security check, then delay it. You're earning 8% increase in benefit. But what happens if I die? It's all a bet. So is your homeowners. What happens if the house catches on fire? What happens if you get in a car accident? That's auto insurance. It's all a bet. What happens if I die? Life insurance. All is a bet. Now, if you ask me what am I doing for Patty, I'm the higher wage earner. I call this the I love you in my office. I love Patty. I'm the higher wage earner. So ideally, I should wait until what age? Because it's the maximum check. What age should I wait to? 70. Because I'm looking at 3,680. Patty's 1,800 or whatever. Upon my death, what check does Patty get? She get both? Yes or no? No. She gets mine. Dad died, was getting 1700 November 16. December 1st, mom got his 1700 What was mom's check previously? 700 Mom got a $1,000 pay raise. So if I love Patty, I should wait until 70 Why? Because I'll be looking out for Patty upon my demise. But as I said earlier, if you need it, do what? Take it. It's all based on need. It's all based on need. There's no right or wrong answer. Okay, Social Security. Number three, your assets. These are all the things that are going to walk in the door. Can you imagine if both of you work here? Double pensions. They were both first. Double Social Security checks. That's four. I'll come get your questions. Got him and I got you. Let me keep going for time. Okay, I promise I'll come get him. He's first, you're second. Now, so I got four checks walking in the door there, correct? Oh, but Dave, you mentioned that 1A TSP. Oh, we're both doing it. So that's two checks. That's two checks. That's two checks. Under assets, Dave, we do these things called the traditional Roth IRA. Oh, bingo. That's another what? Two checks. Now you have eight checks walking in the door. Hot diggity dog. If you want to work after you leave here, it's because you're what? You want to. <laughs> is this a great country or what? Yes or no? Can you imagine anywhere better? Yes or no? I can't. Okay, so do me a favor. Put away money. Because you know what? If these three, in essence, don't cut the mustard, you know what your choices are? I'm going to be Vanna White, Wheel of Fortune. And you don't have to buy a vow. Everybody ready? Blank, O-R-K, or blank, O-B. Anybody know what letters go there? W or what? You know what somebody said at NGA on Tuesday? S for sob. <laughs> I said, that's a new one. I've never had it. Okay? So if these don't cut the mustard because you haven't prepared financially, guess what? It's work or get a job. And by the way, when I run retirement projections, you'd be amazed I become Monty Hall in my office. If you all remember the show, I'm dating myself. It's okay. Let's make a deal. I'm told it's on cable again. I have four doors to choose from. By the way, you're not going to like any of my doors. Door number one. After running your projection, I may tell you all, you need to save more money. You hate that door. 
It takes all the income we make nowadays to survive. Okay, you can't save more, no. Door number two, work longer. Not a very popular door in my office. You ready? Gentleman, 66 years of age and recently. FDA administration. Wife, college professor. 66, wants to retire at 68. First number that came out was door number one. Do you know he needed to save 208000 per year for the next two years to retire? You know what he said to me? Can't do it, it's more than we make. Door's gone. Door number two, you know what I calculated? He'd have to work six more years. He'd have to work until he was 72. Do you think he was a happy camper in my office, yes or no? He was not a happy camper, but I gave him kudos. I said, at least you're here figuring it out. This place should be standing room only. This place should be packed. There should be a line out the door to get in here, to get this information. Why wait? Okay? So, work longer. Very unpopular. I've had it up to here, Dave. You know it. Can I tell you how many times I've heard this? It's the Italian sign after all. Okay? Door number three. Not very popular. Don't retire. Die at your desk. Has it happened here? Yes or no? As the ambulance pulled up out front, I know it has. No matter where I've lectured, in my 40 years, it's happened. Door number four, prayer. Become a consultant or a contractor. Or go work somewhere else. Vanna White. None of my doors are popular. Not one. Do me a favor. Run your number before you leave. You should know. Don't make it a guessing game. You should know what's going to walk in the door. And you should have a handle on your debt. So if you want to carry mortgage into retirement, understand that you can cover that debt. Okay? Am I speaking English? Okay. All right, I've got a couple minutes. Sources of income, everybody's with me? All right. Out there was a mountain chart. Can you grab it a minute? A mountain chart that looked like this. For those of you who might be listening remotely, you're going to have to email me at david.walter at rbc.com to get the mountain chart. For those of you here today, grab them. I'm going to walk you through it. There's two of them. I want you to walk with me first through staying the course. Grab staying the course. Everybody have that one? Yes or no? Everybody have it? All right, watch. Because I talked to you all earlier about CS&I as a strategy. Everybody ready? Show you how to read it. The orange bar. Everybody see the orange colors? Yes or no? Everybody see the orange? The orange is indicative of your C fund. This is your C fund, the S&P 500. 500 biggest companies in this country. The orange is indicative of what? your C fund has done during the calendar year, intra-year. Everybody hear what I said? Every year I can tell you there's been a sale on your C fund. Yes or no? We have had this year a 10% sale on your C fund. So since 1980 there's been a sale. The blue line indicates by December 31st, at the end of the year, Dave, where did my C fund end up for the year? So you had a swing last year of minus 3 in February and 19% positive by the end of the year. It was a 22% swing. Now, if you look down at the bottom, I have some yellow years highlighted. Those are years you finished negative. And there are eight. 2011 was flat. You didn't make a nickel in 11. So you've had, in essence, eight negatives and one flat out of 38. You know what that batting average is? 76%. Can I tease you a minute? I think you know Cal Ripken. If Cal Ripken batted 760, would he have been in the Hall of Fame so fast our heads would spin, yes or no? If Tiger Woods sank 78% of every putt he ever took, would Jack Nicklaus ever be mentioned? And I'll bring it to basketball now, the playoffs. You ready? If Michael Jordan sank 76% of every shot he took, you think LeBron James would be mentioned in the same breath as the best basketball player of all time? So let me ask you all a question. 
With a batting average like that, why isn't the market a megastar? Why is it not a megastar? Go to chart number two that says S&P 500 index, January 1st, 08 through March 29th of 18. These are updated quarterly for me. I requested this chart specifically to show you all. You walked into my office January 1st, 2008 and said, Dave, I want to put 10,000 in the S&P 500, Vanguard Index 500, because I read that's where you should put money. Just put it in the S&P. So we did. January 1st of 08. 15 months later, you were one sour camper. It had dropped 37%. Your $10,000 was worth $6,300. You are not a happy camper. Now, if you follow that straight down to the bottom, everybody look. It says bottom there in a box, March of 09. Do you all see it? So for everybody, and I know it's none of you in here. It's them out there who aren't here today. They ran and left the CS and I funds because they were negative and ran to the what? The G fund. And it shows you that for those folks who moved all that money in March of 2009, 6300 bucks to the G fund, at the end of March 18, their G fund was worth $7,622. They're not even back to the 10 grand that they started with in 2008. Holy macaroni. Now, if you read to the right-hand bottom, these are the G fundaholics. Since January 1st of 08 through March 29th of 18, 10 grand's grown to how much? $12,736. Conversely, if you'd started with 10 in 08, through the end of March, go back to the right-hand side of your page near the top, your money in the C fund grew to how much? $22,431. Everybody see that number? Will that fluctuate going forward, yes or no? Yes. Absolutely, to drive us all to what? To drink. Just do me a favor, write this down. When it drops, Dave said we're having a sale. When it drops, we're having a sale. And then you're going to ask me the question in my office, how long is this sale going to last? I don't know. I didn't get an email. I didn't get a letter. I didn't get any public announcement on how long the sale is going to last. I don't know how long it will last. Can you imagine if in 08 you had done what I told you? You know what I said to people in my office? Add money at 6300 Boy, did I get kicked back, yes or no? Did I get arguing and cussing me and, are you kidding me? Add money now? For anybody who added money when it was 6300 that money's what since 09? What's it done? Tripled. 6300 to 22 grand, it's tripled. But Dave, I'm worried. I stopped the Washington Post gang. I stopped listening to the news. It's all negative. I don't watch CNBC. It stands for causes nothing but confusion. <laughs> I'm not listening to any negativity. Okay, Barbara in Rockville, when I did a review, said, I can't believe you're not listening to the news. I said, Barbara, it's all negative. Yeah, but I'm worried. I, you want to know what you're worried about, Barbara? They're right on that page. China, trade manipulation or currency fluctuation. You're worried about North Korea. Is the little guy going to fire a nuclear missile? Right? Okay, you're worried about Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan. You're worried about Mexico, the wall. You're worried about trade deficits. Yes or no? Now, can I tell you all a secret? I'm going to tell you what I told Barbara. I'm going to call all of you in this room in 2022, and I'm going to ask all of you in this room what happened in 2018. And you know what you're going to tell me? Golly, I don't remember. I don't remember. If you look at all these things on my chart, they're all negatives. Everybody hear what I said? They're negative events. Brexit, 2016, I'm in the office. 600 point drop on a Friday. 300 point drop on Monday. Tuesday morning, I walk in the office. 12 phone calls. Oh boy, here we go again. Everybody thinking we're back to 09. First eight phone calls, I want to buy. Oh, you're the smart people. Next four phone calls. What's this going to do to me? Look on the chart. I said it's a blip. It's a dip. Then you know what I got asked. I already told you what I got asked. How long is it going to last? I don't know. If I knew, I wouldn't need you as a client. I'd be making money. Okay? Now, you know what the next wall of worry was? What happens if Trump wins? To show you I'm not infallible, I don't walk on water. You know what I said in my office? He'll never get the nomination, he'll never win. What happened? Wow. Wow, what a shocker. 
I was a bet man he'd never get the nomination and never win. Oh well. So guess what? There'll always be something to what? Worry about. Stop it. Nancy comes in my office. Dave, I'm moving my TSP all to G, and I want you to move my IRA all to cash. Why? Because I work at DOD, NSA, and that guy's going to fire a nuclear missile at Guam. So you know what I did? I went over to the window and I said, hmm, looks like the cars are still going up and down Little Patuxen Parkway. I said, Nancy, if tonight, on the way home, you need to buy groceries, you're going to stop at Giant Food or Safeway and get groceries? Absolutely. If you need gas in, gas in your car to get to work tomorrow, you're going to put gas in your car? Absolutely. If you need to pick up your cleaning at Zips, your dry cleaning to go to work tomorrow, you're going to pick it up? Absolutely. I bet you dollars to donuts, Nancy, tomorrow morning there are still cars going up and down Little Patuxen Parkway. So I'm going to warn you all now, the world's not coming to an end. Sorry, I'm not a doomsayer. I believe in the Bible, Revelations doesn't give a date. Sorry. There's no date given. So I'm not a doomsayer. I'm not one of these people. Sorry. I don't like negativity. I would urge all of you to put on blinders and earmuffs and quit listening to all the negativity. That's the media's job. I didn't say ignore the news. I just said, just don't focus on it. You had a question, and then I got to quit. Okay, your first name is? Klein. Klein. Klein said, Dave, you didn't mention the life cycle funds. You kind of alluded to them. Klein, my only gripe is that they, got, they have the F fund, as you know, to some extent. So, Klein, I would prefer to buy the individuals. It doesn't mean don't be diversified. The L fund is very diversified. And it's, if you want to go to lunch, go to dinner, and never worry about anything. As you know, it's adjusted quarterly. The idea being, Klein, that as I get closer to retirement, more and more money goes to where? The F and G. By the way, Clyde, I've had people come in my office and say, I'm in, all in the L income fund because I'm retired. I have no money in the market until I show them, Clyde, that 20% of their money is in the market still. And that's permanent. There's no little clicker there on the screen. So for folks who shift all of the L income fund, they're still in the market. Clyde, I would prefer to buy the individuals. But if, but if you say to me, Dave, I like the diversification, do me a favor, Clyde, you, with this, you don't have to worry about, Dave, when are the sales in my example climb? By definition, you're putting money in over 26 what? Pay periods. If you come my way, because you're more growth oriented, and climb, I said you're more what? Growth oriented. Then you're going to pick up sales every time they happen. And you don't have to worry about market timing. But for the faint of heart, and they want to be more diversified and be in L funds, have at it. Whose money is it, climb? Your money. You had a question over here. Yes, sir. Okay, it's Social Security because I thought like you, you have your Social Security, you die, and then your spouse gets like half of it. So what did you say? You said if you die, your wife gets your... Patty's getting my check, just like best example was dad. Dad died. Dad was receiving $1,700 a month right. at 91 years of age. At the time, mom was 89. Okay, mom's getting Both 700 of them Both of them were receiving Social Security. Upon dad's death, effective December 1st, mom was entitled to the 1700 And mom's now drawing or receiving 1700 So if you have two spouses that are both getting Social Security, the older one should wait it out until 70 to get the larger check. Is that what you're saying? If, one. if they don't what? Need the money. I'm caveating it big time. I'm in a position now where I said to Patty, we don't need that money. I'm going to wait because I what? I love her. Okay? Now I'm going to segue. You got one question? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The L, the L funds? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. Your first name was? Carlos says, Dave. What about the L funds as I get closer to retirement? Yes? All right. I'm 64. You know what I am? Pedal to the metal for growth. Why? Because I could live another 27 years like my dad, and I want growth. Do I like when the market dips? 
No. I'm no different than the rest of us sitting here today. But what has gone down is always going back up. So I'm not oriented towards F and G. I don't want to earn 2%. I'm not interested. I want to earn more. Are there years where your 2% will beat me? Absolutely, unequivocally. But in the long run, if you look at this, even with the debacle that was akin to our parents' depression, the 08 09 was like our parents' depression. The average was 8.20. Good and bad dips, dips, right? Peaks, dips, valleys, all that good stuff. So I'm more growth oriented. And I try and teach my clients that the various goods and services you use, Verizon, Comcast, okay, whether it's Fios or whomever, okay, Procter & Gamble, Colgate Palmolive, Home Depot, Lowe's, Macy's, wherever you go, you're feeding somebody's bottom line. Baltimore Gas Electric, you pay an electric bill. Why don't you get in their pocket? They're in yours. They're not gonna take the money they make and put it in a G fund. They reinvest it back in what? In the company. So I sit here and I chuckle the various goods and services that we use every day. We're feeding somebody's bottom line. If any of you bought bottled water at lunch, if any of you bought lunch in cafeteria, you're feeding somebody's bottom line on the way home tonight. You're contributing to some company's bottom line. Why don't you own them? And I'm not talking about the millennials who call me and go, I want to buy Bitcoin. Oh, stop it. Just stop it. <laughs> or I get phone calls, as you know, I've got a tip. I've been there 40 years. I'd love to have a penny for every tip. Or I want to buy the, this company has the next cure for cancer. Right. Stop it. Just stop it. Buy Cadillac, Mercedes, Lincoln, BMW. Buy quality. Junk begats junk. There is no fast way to fortune. Stop reading the stories. Do you ever read about all the lottery losers? Yes or no? Do we read about all the poor souls who buy tickets and never win? Yes or no? We only read about who? And then if you go back and look at the winners, most of them have done what with the money years later? It's blown. Stop it. Pay yourselves first. TSP, IRAs next. Get your ducks in a row. Before you walk out of this building, and as I said to you, you have some advantages. Pension, Social Security, TSP, IRAs, fund them, fund them, fund them, fund them, fund them. You'll never cuss me. Okay? Now, when you get to distribution phase, you all call me. Why? Because I can beat your TSP hands down the day you leave here. While you're working, fund your TSP. Really, you can beat our TSP? Yes, I can. Hands down. April 30th, 08 to April 30th, 18. If you put 50 grand in CSIFG, your 250 grand invested is 437, 435 10 years later. Morningstar's best funds, 581, 371 versus 437, after all costs. Who likes 581? Anybody? Versus 437. But you can't do this till you quit or retire. So don't even think about what I've said until you what? Retire. While you're here, do what? Max the plan at work. Call me when you retire. Then you can beat it. Okay? Not while you're working. Now, that's distribution phase. Last phase of your life, transfer phase. John's going to speak to that. You want to leave people to the money whom you what? Love. If you have no will now, which we're going to address, that's okay. If you don't have a will sitting here, the state of Maryland has one for you. If you live in Virginia or the district, they have one for you. I'm not sure you're going to like where they're going to distribute your assets to. So we want to be prepared and in a position to that when we hit the transfer phase of our lives, we're leaving money to the people we love or like. Okay? All right, John will speak to them. And I'll be here for questions later after we finish. Thanks, Dave. Yes. So Dave took the fun part of the, I get to talk about planning for what's next if we're not here or something happens to us. So Dave, uh, Dave gets to take the fun part of it. Um, one comment I was going to make on the life cycle fund, just as a side note, as they always go as you get closer to that age or that retirement age or whatever it is, they're pushing more into the fixed income side of the equation. The key there is it, let's say that was happening in 08 or 09. 
you may not want to push in that direction at that time. You may actually, like Dave says, there's a sale. You'd rather be going in the equity side. So keep that in mind on those pieces. But I get to talk about mortality. Um, most of us in this room, it's not something we like to think about. And men are the worst, by the way. Dave and I have them in our office all the time, and we're never going to die. So we don't have to plan. So, for example, um, we actually have a live situation right now. Dave's neighbor, a good friend of his, went down to Tennessee, and he was going to see his mom who has cancer and take her to treatment. He is an avid swinner, swimmer. He's very strong. He's been swimming for a long time. He decided to go out for a swim on Tuesday morning, and as of now, they are still looking for him. So the unexpected always happens. We never know. We never plan for it. Um, and that's the part of the equation I want to give you guys right now. So what I want to start with, I want to start with a couple things where you can literally walk out of here today and do a couple things to make sure that you've got your ducks in a row, per se. And some of them are very, very simple. So for example, we try to tell people to do like a physical inventory list. In this example, go through your home, right? What do we have? TVs, anything of value that you can write down. Cars, uh, jewelry, we all have computers and laptops. Take an inventory of these things, write them down. Then go and look at the other items, our TSPs, 401ks, IRAs. Write all these items down. And the key here is, is that when you're not around, right, it's hard for someone else to come behind you and clean up or help out. And unless you've really gone through it, we, it's really hard to see. In other words, we talk about it all the time. Our goal is to constantly prepare you for it, not tomorrow or the next day. It's one year, three year, five, 10, 25 years down the road. So we're always trying to make you think. And in this scenario, what ends up happening, it's an example. No one knows what's going to happen tomorrow in the situation we just gave you with the gentleman that went swimming. But now you have to come behind them. Their brother, sister, wife, spouse. And in my household, uh, my wife, Ginny, she is not numbers oriented. It's not her favorite thing. So I do all of the numbers. I manage all of the bills. I pay everything. I've got all the usernames and passwords. And literally, she probably couldn't get into the bank account if she tried. So in this case, another thing you want to write down is usernames and passwords. Okay? Keep a list of, you know, if you've got a bank, maybe it's Capital One, username, password. Keep all these things handy just in case someone has to come behind you. One of the things that we do have, and I can always send you, it's a, it's a late, make you think. It's like, who's your CPA? Who's your attorney? Who's your dentist, doctor? Uh, where do you have bank accounts, credit cards? All these things that no one really wants to think about and come behind. Um, as well, you also want to go ahead and look at your credit card debt. Not debt cards, any debt that you may have. So that's mortgages, car loans. Um, this can include, as well, on the other assets, you've got life insurance. Some of us have long-term care which Dave and I will always beat you up about. It's not something that everyone likes to talk about from an insurance standpoint, but it's something that, the way I describe it to everyone is, we go through life and you guys have been saving for 20, 30, some of us have been saving for 40 years, right? And all along the way, we've had what? Homeowner's insurance, right? Car insurance, we've even had life insurance, Right? And hopefully we've never had to make a claim. But it's inevitable. For the most part, some of us are going to need health care needs down the road. The numbers are staggering and we're living longer and we need help somewhere. And it can't always be that your spouse is going to be there to take care of you. In some examples, just getting from a, in and out of a tub could be complicated, right? You're not physically capable of doing it. So my argument to you on long-term care, keep this in mind, is if you're not a fan of insurance, at least take a look at it. Understand what it is and what the options are and how I can help you. I don't ever want my client, Dave doesn't want our, our clients, to ever come back to us and say, why didn't you tell me about long-term care? In our, in our business, it's all about education. My goal is to educate you and give you as much information as we possibly can. You guys have the opportunity to get long-term care. The sooner the better. Right? As we get the, we've got runners, right? All of a sudden they've got a knee problem or something happens, they have to go to a hospital. It could be difficult to get it after that point for six to 12 months. Uh, if we get diagnosed with uh, some form of cancer, that can happen as well. Um, different example right now, 
My mom has had breast cancer, she's had lung cancer, and she survived both of them. Somewhere in there between there, there was enough time, and she went into remission, that I was able to get her long-term care. She recently got diagnosed with onsets of Alzheimer's. So she used to call me, right, and say, John, my long-term care bill just came, and they're raising my rate, because up until, I don't know how long ago, but it wasn't too long ago, they could always say, we never raised your rates. They can't say that anymore, okay? And she's like, John, what do I do? I said, Mom, don't ever call me and ask me this question again. I said, you pay it. Because if I were to run it for you, for example, somebody gets it at 55, 65 years old, and at 70 years old, they want me to run it again, it's double. So keep that in mind, okay? So we're doing a physical inventory. You guys are taking, a, taking a account of all of your assets, everything you own. In some cases, you can even use a video camera if you want to do the home, okay? So these are just things I'm trying to give you. We'll get into revocable trusts and living, you know, wills and those things, but these are things you can go home and do today, okay? So I'm trying to give you some takeaways. Um, uh, let's see. What you want to do, essentially, is after you've completed the task, okay, sign it, have somebody witness it, go put it in your uh, safe deposit box, I keep a fireproof safe in my house, not big, but I keep birth certificates, passports, uh, inventories, so it's a way to kind of keep things. And make sure somebody knows or has a copy of this somewhere, all right? So these are just the basic, easy things to do. One of the things that a lot of clients forget and we have to remind them of is beneficiaries. Go back and look at your TSP beneficiaries. Look at your IRA beneficiaries. Make sure that the person that you want your assets to go to, that's where they go. When we get into this just a little deeper, this supersedes your will. So we're all going to have a will at some point. But as you have a beneficiary on your thrift savings plan, on your IRAs, it goes directly to your beneficiary. So make sure they're updated. And it gets missed quite often. If we lose a spouse for some reason, and let's say their IRA comes to me, I need to make sure that I update because probably my primary was my spouse. Do I want it to go to my kids? I have two girls, you know, that's where it would go. They're my contingent. So double check those. Bank accounts, if we've got joint accounts, what happens to them? If one of us passes away, it goes directly to our spouse. If we have an individual account, what happens? It goes via our will. And if we don't have that up to date or we haven't updated it, it may not go the way we want it to. Yes, ma'am. You can. So my next part was to say that what you want to do on an individual account at a bank, it's called POD, which is payable on death. So you can specifically state, and again, this is when the examples are easy. If it's to go to our two kids, we just put them down, okay? They're payable on death to our two children. In some cases, it's not always that easy, and that's where we'll get into a, like a revocable trust, for say. But if it's not easy, we need to be careful. Otherwise, payable on death at banks, at firms like us, it would be TOD, transfer on death. So whenever we have an individual account, we always want to make sure that if we have the opportunity to put that on there, uh, we can do that. So again, these are things that you guys should check and update as much as you can. Um, that's the TOD. What happens eventually is we're going to obviously need a will. Everyone needs to get a will. How many of you have a will? How many of you checked it within the lab? How many has a will? All right, we need to up that a little bit. So everyone should have a will. And again, it's the unexpected always happens. And this is for the things that maybe we don't have taken care of. So maybe we don't have a trust, which we'll talk about in a moment. But that's gonna, the will is going to dictate how a car goes, how some other assets, if they weren't titled properly, go. Uh, they're also going to go through probate. So one of the things, the tools that we can use and talk about is a trust. And what a trust does, an example, we could put our home in a trust, and we'll move into that in just a moment. But a trust will allow us to avoid probate. It also keeps things private. It makes sure that things go the way we want them to go, the direction that we want them to go, okay? But a will, and again, these are the questions Dave and I constantly ask. The first thing we say is, do you have a will? And if you don't, let's get it done. If you're single or married, somewhere between $1,500 and $2,500 is the range. She gets you a will, a power of attorney, 
and healthcare directive. So those are the main important planning tools that you want to make sure that you have in place. How many of you actually have a trust set up? No? All right. Dave does. So let's kind of move forward. What we'll do is I want to talk about these are the four key, key pieces that we would go through, OK? Um, so the first piece is a revocable living trust. Normally, how we're going to use these is it's an estate planning tool, obviously. But this is to avoid probate, like I said. And it's to make sure that we have assets go the direction that we want them to go. So, and the key here as well is not everybody needs a trust, OK? The, biggest, the easiest way to see where someone needs a trust usually is either you've got large assets and we want to make sure they're handled properly. But the second one is sometimes we've got a second marriage or we've got multiple kids involved from two different marriages and it gets complicated. If you just say, and I, I had this conversation recently, it was, well, if everything goes to the spouse, and let's say she has two kids and he has two kids, right? You'd like to think that everybody's honest, but what can happen is there's a falls to the one side of the tree, and unfortunately, they don't, aren't obligated at that point to take care of the other side. So in a trust, that alleviates that pain. I'll give you an example. Uh, I call it the tricky trust. It's a, it's a client that I have. Uh, dad has a decent amount of assets. He also has property in another state. He has two sons. One of the sons is taking care of him, supposedly. He lives in their home. He pays their mortgage. And come to find out, he's actually taking assets. He's paying bills, using his credit card. And the other brother finds out. So what we have to do is now we've got to get trusts in place. We have to move all the assets out to make sure he doesn't have access to them. And they're not in agreement. Now, the brother, this other brother doesn't want to t unfairly take assets, but he's already got tires. He's making car payments for them. He's bought a new HVAC. He's put a new driveway in. He got bigger tires on his car. So that's a situation where a trust becomes very powerful for you and necessary, OK? Um, this thing's backwards. So there, there's lots of different names for it. Intervivos trust is another example of a name for it. And again, when we say it's a separate legal entity or property, it's a trust. But the key here is it also remains in your social security number. Okay? And we've got some examples here of how it flows. But there's two different. There's revocable. And what that means is I can put any asset into this trust. Okay? I can put a house. I can put a car. I can put assets in it. And I can also say, I don't want them in there. I can take it out. I can cancel the trust. I can do anything I want. That's a revocable trust. Irrevocable is different. I put assets in, and they don't come out, and they're not under my tax ID number. An irrevocable trust will have its own tax ID. Okay, It's outside of your estate as well. So again, here it says you can change the terms at any time. Um, again, this is also called a living trust. It's while you're alive. Okay, This is a living trust. And it'll say it later here, but essentially, when you die or pass away, this trust becomes irrevocable. It dies with you, essentially. Some of this I may have already covered. Uh, let's take a look. Uh, individuals, but everyone, this type of commonly used to avoid probate. I mentioned that as well. Uh, maintain management of one's financial affairs during incapacity. So. When we set this up, and I've got an example in here, maybe we should jump to it. But essentially, you're going to pick people. And this is, this is usually where everyone stops, right? Because the, they're not sure of, and again, this is why we stop on a will sometimes. Well, who do I want to take care of my kids, right, if something happens to me? Um, and we stop the planning process. In here, you want to make sure when you're setting up a trust that you pick the right person. Somebody can handle the financials of it. Uh, maybe somebody else handles the healthcare perspective of it, but you've got to make sure that you pick the right individuals. It's important. Uh, let's see. Uh, keep going backwards. So here it talks about various purposes of what it's going to accomplish for you. Again, property continues the way we want. As Dave said, Maryland's got a will for you. It may not be the way you want things to go. When we take it and put it into a trust, the attorney's going to say to you specifically, who's important to you? 
How do you want things to go? Is it supposed to be to the kid? And again, sometimes I've got another situation where it's a different trust, but it is, um, child is, is not able to take care of themselves, and they never will be able to. So we've got a separate trust for them. We've got someone that can manage the assets for them, but they're planning. They know that they're not always going to be here, but the child is not able to manage assets. They just can't do it. So we'd have a separate trust for a situation like that as well. Um, again, avoiding probate, we always hear this. It takes time and it costs more money. If we have a trust, it's just handled according to our instructions the way we choose, not the way going through probate, paying. It's a lot of more time. Uh, this is more private. No one has to know exactly what happens on your trust. Uh, if you go through probate, it's a bit of public record. Uh, let's see. In the situation when you open up the trust, you are considered the grantor, right? You put the assets in, so you are the grantor. Um, you control those assets, as we said. You decide where they go. You decide who the sole beneficiary is. If you're married, lots of times your spouse is going to be, I don't say beneficiary, but she might be the person who the assets are intended for. And essentially, if something happens to you, she could also be, in other words, the person who would handle this trust in the case you're in, uh, not able to take care of it or incapacity happens. Um, again, successor trustee, co-trustee, and again, often it's a spouse or a child. Um, in my situation now, I'm, I'm at a tough spot, right? So my mom manages all of the assets. And I, I honestly, I think it was not five years ago, my dad asked me how to get money out of an ATM. So he's not managing the money. Uh, but I will have to go on and get usernames, passwords, and start paying bills and figuring these things out. So again, the burden is starting to fall on me. Uh, so making sure that you've got the proper person in the place, whether it's a spouse, a child, um, and those co-trustees are the person you picked. So this is during your life. This is a nice little illustration. It shows how the assets work. Grantor or trustee, we put the assets in there. So be careful. What happens lots of times, some of us will go see an attorney. We get the trust all set up. We've got the paperwork. And then what we don't do is we don't move the assets into the trust. So quite often we see trusts that are not funded. You need to make sure, for example, on our end, we change the account. It's now the trust. We move the assets into the trust. It's not um, a taxable event, right? We're not gifting, right? We're just moving assets over. Cars you can do, same with the house. So lots of times when you set these up, don't forget there's another step afterwards. So now in this example, the trust owns the assets, distributed income, assets, everything they own. Any income, anything, tax returns, you're still responsible for it, okay, coming out of the trust. And then there's a successor trustee steps in to manage if the assets or the grantor becomes incapacitated. So you've, you've already picked that person. If you wait until that situation happens, it becomes very time consuming, it can be very complicated, it can be embarrassing, and it actually can be difficult. If you get two of them that don't agree, you get a brother, or sister, or whatever it is, and we don't agree, it just complicates the situation even more. So again, here, grantor, let's just call myself the grantor. I'm gonna continue to manage the assets. Again, it could be real estate properties, rental properties, I'm gonna continue to do this for as long as I can. At some point, I may just decide I don't want to do it and I'll take myself off. Maybe I'll ask the co-trustee to handle it. Uh, any income earned, trust that flows right through to me, I'm still responsible. Um, and again, there's no separate return for the trust. On an irrevocable, that's different. Um, here it talks about the incapacity, right? So we've mentioned this already once. Um, and again, here we're talking about special knowledge. Who knows how to manage property properly. Right? Not, my sister probably couldn't manage property. She could manage, she's a lot more sensitive than me. She could probably manage my mom's care, right? She would be better at that aspect of it than say I would. So, and again, I talked about making sure it was funded after it was created. Let's not forget that. It's an important piece of it. Um, transferring legal title, cars, trucks, um, again here, checking, saving, CDs, life insurance policies, any stocks, bonds, any accounts that you have, making sure that we finish the process there. 
So here's what happens at death, okay? So upon my passing, the successor trustee basically takes over. They're included in my estate, so any assets that I have in there, they're part of my estate. The successor trustee is now going to manage it. And as I said, upon your death, the revocable trust dies with you. It now becomes irrevocable, okay? So, and again as well, lots of times in our will, and you'll hear this phrase a lot, it's called a pour over. So in our will, when we set this up, we're going to have it so that any assets that we may have forgotten or left out will pour over into the trust. So that's called a pour over uh, will into the trust. Um, now our successor trustee, and maybe it was my spouse in this, chance, in this case, she takes over. Okay, now she is the actual trustee. And now it's a separate taxpayer, trust distributes assets, income. It has its own tax ID. And now we're filing tax returns for that and everything. But the assets have gone the way that we have chosen, not per se if we've forgotten a will or something happened where we didn't choose a beneficiary. Again, the beneficiary, you still need to make sure you handle those. But again, now upon my passing, my wife needs to go update her beneficiaries. And those aren't things we always remember. So as I said at the very beginning, this isn't always suitable for everyone. Again, I think what, now it's what, 11.18 million on um, the estate tax, federal estate tax. And the majority of us, and again, it's probably 1% actually apply to that. So for the most part, when it comes to the state, federal estate tax exemptions, it's not gonna apply to a lot of us. And not everyone needs a trust. So in here, we talk about who's it good for. If we own lots of different pieces of real estate, maybe we even own it in different states, right? We've got rental properties. That actually complicates things. Having a trust will simplify and help in that situation. Um, if you already know, for example, you're going to have problems with health or uh, physically, you might not be able to handle things or mentally you can't handle things in advance. You're working towards it. That's what we're talking about. So if we have clients sitting down with us and they're telling us their kid is totally financially irresponsible and they're 30 something now, well, and they've got decent assets, we're going to talk about a trust for them, and maybe they get it at a later date, or maybe they get it in pieces, but we dictate when those assets get distributed, as opposed to they get this big lump sum, as in a lottery, and they didn't know how to manage it in the first place, and they blow through the money. So that's not what we want to see happen. Um, a, yeah, move on. So this was an example. I'll, I'll run through these. Uh, here was a woman, they own an asset of the home of 600, checking and savings, CDs, bonds. Essentially, the total assets here were 1.6 million. You can see it kind of on the spreadsheet. So what it does is it avoids guardianship, probate. In other words, the guardianship is if um, someone had to dictate whether we were, could manage it or not. So we've already got this in place. We don't have to sit there when all of a sudden my mom's not capable of taking care of something and I have to have a debate with my sister about how we're going to handle things. Those things are already taken care of. So durable power of attorney. Uh, this allows someone to carry on all our financial affairs. Very important. Okay. The de when you go and sit down, you're going to get a will done. You're going to get the durable power of attorney done as well. It'll protect your property in a period of incapacity, um, judicial approval. All this stuff goes through. It'll be handled in advance and not last minute when it's complicated. Um, it basically, you're giving that person the rights to step into your shoes almost and do anything that you would normally do. They can act legally as though you were making those decisions. And sometimes it's extremely important um, that we do those in advance. Attorney, in fact, is another term that we use for this. Um, so again, we talk about life expectancy increasing, physical, mental capacity, I've already mentioned, uh, being a problem. Illnesses, accidents, why would you want to do this? Old age, Alzheimer's, um, people to pay bills, write checks. This durable power of attorney is going to give them the capacity and ability to do this for you and not trying to figure this out later. We're running out of time here. Um, again, it could be any relative, friend, spouse. Um, again, you, don't, you avoid all of this. This talks about the embarrassing or emotional draining. Uh, let's see the person who trusts them. So I keep the cord out of it. And again, it keeps the cord out of it, correct. So there's two types. 
standby, which means basically you need to be ready now to share this capacity with someone as they can, it's effective as soon as you sign it. A springing becomes effective upon your incapacitation when you can't handle something, so it springs into effect. So make sure you understand how the difference is and which one you would prefer because it's important. Uh, this person can step in right away or we want when something happens. Normally that's the springing power of attorney that you want. Um, and again, it's most states it's not a problem. Again, this talks about a minor. You have to be 18 years of old. 18 years old, let's move to... Um, This just talks about what they can do, and I already mentioned this. Your attorney, in fact, as I said, they stand in your shoes. They can do whatever you give them authorization to do. Gifting, they can do anything as though it were you. Again, this is a good, just a good piece right here. It talks about all the things that they can do. Sign checks, deposit funds, run your business, um, everyday expenses, uh, mortgage, real estate, buy, sell, insurance, policies, annuities. So, this is a good page for you. I think it's in your, your handout. And again, it ends when you die. So same concept, again, as the um, revocable trust. So this is the healthcare power of attorney. Same concept, but again, what we're looking at here is according to our health. And the reason this is so important is we may get to some point and maybe they, we don't want to be resuscitated or somebody to revive us. You're giving someone instructions. You're giving this healthcare proxy that's going to say your written authorization is to do X or know what you want. And you can have a conversation with them in advance about how you want things handled. This, the worst thing is, is when you get there and it's not there, first of all, you have to figure out who's going to be in charge. And lots of times it's the brother and sister or whatever it might be. They're not going to agree. And it becomes extremely complicated. So as a planning tool for estate planning, this is another piece that is just... You can't leave it out, and this is something everyone needs to get done in advance. The last part of this is the will, which we've already kind of mentioned, um, the living will. This is just a legal document that everyone sees. So this is usually your starting point is your will. Not everyone needs a revocable trust. Again, if I mentioned a situation that hit home with you, those are the people that may want to look into a revocable trust the power of attorney, and your health care directive. So I know we're really close and we haven't gotten a chance to give anybody any uh, questions. So do we want to open it up, the moderator to open up for questions? Okay. Moderator, could you unmute the phone lines to see if there's any questions, please? Yes, ma'am. Um, is there a The lines have been unmuted. What was the last piece? If the spouse remarries after your death and you don't want the assets so that's, the second one, that seems to be a very common Yep. Question. So what she's saying basically as a beneficiary, is there a way that if your spouse, um, let's say you pass away, my spouse, Ginny, is my beneficiary. And let's say it's kind of young, right? And Ginny's more likely to get remarried. But I want to make sure that my assets go to my kids. How do I handle that situation? In that situation, it's a trust. And what you want to do, and again, that's usually a difficult conversation. It is a difficult conversation. You guys have to understand why you're doing that, and specifically that you want your assets or whatever portion to go to the kids. So in that situation, it's exactly where you would look to a trust to solve that problem. If you do it via... Um, just beneficiaries or anything like I was saying, that side of the tree could get cut off some. He gets remarried, has new kids, um, and part of your assets end up going this direction and you have no intention of that. So a trust is, would solve that situation. Would it be the, I'm sorry, the uh, ir irrevocable or revocable? Uh, you would, so the question was, would that be a revocable or irrevocable trust? Um, the irrevocable trust on, on most occasions, you're going to do something like let's call it a life insurance. You want to buy a big policy. And let's just say it's a million dollars life insurance policy. 
In that situation, you do something that would be an irrevocable or an irrevocable life insurance trust. And that's outside of your estate. In this situation, though, you'd probably start off with a revocable trust um, because you're not dealing with anything that needs to be outside of your estate. You just want to make sure that assets funnel the way you want them to. So the instructions to the revocable trust will answer that for you. Yes, sir. Okay. Because as my lawyer explained it, like that person as of today can take that document and start writing checks on my name. And legally, like I mean, it's obviously you've got to trust that person because that person can legally do it. And there's no course that you're saying that this person do it. Nowhere does it say on there you have to be incapacitated or to what no, there, you're incapacitated. And so how do you get around trusting that the person you trust is, is it going to take advantage of that? I, the answer to that one is I don't have a good answer, yeah. right? So that's why I'm saying to you it's so important when you pick those individuals, right. you know, they, are they going to execute the way you want them to? And if you have any doubt that they're not, if you start off that way, then you kind of have to think maybe they're not. And again, I know you trust them today, but you're thinking well, again, maybe their situation the, changes. The reason I think about it is I have a next-door neighbor and their friend son said to the father, you're getting older, you know, we got to start thinking about the future, you know, you need to sign your house over to me, because if anything happens, you know, Run. you need to make sure that you're not homeless, and then they said, once the, the son had the house, he kicked the father out, and I mean, it's, it's, when you think about things like that, you don't, uh, I know in my own family, yeah. that money changes people, Sure. and that's the thing, like, with all of these things, you think you trust somebody, The answer is you really have to reevaluate all the time. In that situation, though, I mean, that's just, you've got a dishonest person in the loop, and you'd like to think that there was someone to help them out. So they've just gotten very bad advice, and they've, they've taken it. My mom, personally, I mean, I, she checks in with me, my mom and dad, and they were getting ready to buy another place. I said, slow down. We just found this out. We haven't even told dad. Let's get things figured out. So you've got to just, it, it's an advice thing. It's just somebody that's got to be in the loop that's a trusted source. When those things, and again, we hear it all the time. It's not the first time we've heard those stories by any means. I even have others where, yes, just yesterday it was, um, we had given the woman $16,000. She wanted to fix up her kitchen. And she's been putting money into her daughter for years and years and years, and she's, she's sick. She's, she's on drugs. And she said it didn't go there. It went to rehab again. And this isn't the first, second, or third time. So the assets are going to somewhere else. But in your situation, what you're saying is it's, it's only as good as the person you elect. Right. And if you find out that that's not, again, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put it into place right away. Me personally, I wouldn't have that, give someone that power while I'm still functioning <clears throat> and can think through all my situations. I'm not going to put that power in their hands. I'm going to wait until a until something else happens that they've got the power to go ahead and do that when I can't, when what I... What happens if something happens when you have a stroke and you're not in that? At that point, you can't do anything. That, it, it, and that's why, shouldn't you do it before that? Correct. Okay. Yeah. And again, it's just a matter of, of whom you're working with and who you trust. And again, every, they say every two years to go back. I mean, you can do it every five years, but go back and reevaluate. Make sure you look at these documents to make sure the way you want them. Yes, ma'am. I just want to know the best route to go for. I have two daughters. I'm only concerned with if something happened to both me and my husband. I would just want everything to be equally shared between the two of them. So what's the best route? What can I put in place for that? Sure. So the question was, I, I actually went through. Your situation actually is very clean. It's the exact same situation as mine. I have a wife and I have two daughters. So on my IRAs, I have my wife as my beneficiary. <laughs> and the contingents are my two daughters. So that's the way I have everything set up. Now, what happens if the other scenario we talked about was the husband or wife remarries? That can change the situation down the road, but you're not here. So at that point, it's, you have to have a conversation with your husband, make sure that everybody knows which way they want the assets to go. So your TSP or whatever it is, it would be you as the um, owner, your husband as the beneficiary, and your two contingent 50-50 would be with your, with your children. 
Now, if everything goes accordingly, the assets would flow exactly the way you want them to. If something were to change down the road, whether one was more financially needy than the other and you wanted it to be 60-40, you can still do that. You just change the percentages on the contingent um, down the road. Uh, I think he has the mic right back here. One second. Uh, yeah, so what, is, what approach would you recommend for, um, f for a parent? A parent, I have a parent who, let's say, is um, displaying onset dementia. may not be Alzheimer's, but they still have some, um, they still have most of their faculties. Uh, what would be the best vehicle, a, a, a power of attorney, a, a trust, a living will? So all of those in general should be in place, but this is where you step in and you guys reevaluate. So make sure that you know where the accounts are. Make sure that do that inventory. Make sure you understand everything they have. And is she the person that, is your mom the one that takes care of everything? Okay, so what you want to do is, is slowly, and I'm in the process, to, to slowly kind of take pieces away so that you're managing them and they don't get in a situation where all of a sudden the kid's neighbor's friend tells them you got to go get the house out of somebody's name and before you know it, something happened. So those, the, the health care directive is, is one of the most important things in that equation. You want to make sure that you understand what she wants to have happen and that you follow those through. But again, all those should be in place. Will, power of attorney, health care directive, get those in place. And as far as the assets go, if it's a larger number of assets, make sure that you guys are speaking to her and saying, what do you want with the house, jewelry, things like that, you know, the will. And she could write something out specifically. You can take pictures of jewelry items and write specifically on it whom it's to go to. Put it in that file. So that's how you can make sure things go that direction. We're in that time. You're done. I'm done. Sorry. Okay. That concludes our seminar. We still have one second seminar that will be starting in a few minutes. So let's take a, what, a five-minute break so we can pick up and go.